Hi, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our residence forum. This is our third uh, for resident forum that we've put together to try to make sure that we can reach out to the future of this academy. And we're still trying to feel this out. We're still trying to figure out the best format to reach our residents. So I really appreciate all the speakers that have made the effort to be here today as well, and my co-moderator, Dr. Ruthie Arumala, is, because it shows the passion that we have for this academy, for the training, for the growth of this academy. But we're again, just learning, trying to figure out the best way to reach out to our residents. So if after this session, you can take some mo a moment to put together some thoughts and different approaches, I know that we would appreciate that. I know Margaret would appreciate that. But let me give you a little introduction about myself. I'm Dr. Susan Abaji, and I came to this meeting for the first time in 1999. So how many of you have been here before that? I have officially been here longer than most of you. There was one year only that I didn't come, and that was when I was having a baby. My first one, I was a resident, and I was lecturing on chemical peels, and I was pregnant at that time as well. So I have very fond memories growing up in this organization, and I have a very strong affinity for this organization, even more so than for my primary field, which is in dermatology. Because I think, as you've seen without, throughout this meeting, you're meeting doctors from all over the world, all, all different specialties, all with a passion that is aligned with our own, which is to be the best cosmetic surgeons we can be, to be the most well-trained cosmetic surgeons that there are, and then to propagate that forward. So with that, I want to welcome everybody here today. And I just want to know who are our residents in this audience right now? Oh, we have a good amount. I love it. And we're going to grow it. You guys are the future of this academy. Remember that. And our goal today is to inspire you because we're going to introduce you into the life of a training fellow. We're going to also have you meet some of the top leaders in our academy, and you're going to hopefully see the same shared passion we all have for it. And with that, I'm gonna hand things over to my colleague here, Dr. Ruth Arumala, who just recently finished her training and is about to embark on starting her career in cosmetic surgery in Texas. Thank you. I'm so excited that you guys are here because um, like Dr. Baji said, we, everybody in this um, organization is the future of cosmetic surgery. We're the ones that are going to break boundaries. We're the ones that are going to introduce cosmetic surgery to our primary specialties. We're the ones that are going to propagate this field. And so I want us to leave this session with ideas, connections, and inspiration about what is to come. So before I get started, please feel free throughout this uh, session to ask any questions. Don't feel like, um, you know, this is a safe space as we use these days. It's a safe space. So ask any questions. And I'm sure everybody will be happy to share their expertise, experience, and the, some of the things that they will rather not do again. Um, so without further ado, I want to bring up our first um, panelist slash slash present, uh, presenter to the audience or to the, you guys. And it is Dr. Brittany Edson. Come on up, girl. So. <laughs> Dr. Edson is a board certified oral and maxillary facial surgeon. She's currently a fellow, so she'll be giving you her insight. Um, and she's doing a facial fellowship and she will be joining um, her own practice, which she's building in Michigan after she finishes. So go ahead, girl. Get Thank it. you. All right, do I have a clicker? <laughs> I have a clicker? All right, good morning, everybody. Thanks for listening to me talk about this, but I'm gonna talk about why the AACS is unique. Um, so in my experience, I didn't come right out of residency. Um, so I had a short little career. I was in the Army for 13 years. So after I finished residency, I was a surgeon in the Army. So I did 
full scope oral maxillofacial surgery and I mean all the while knowing that I wanted to do cosmetic surgery but I had to get out from uh, you know under the army so proud to have served but I had a little bit of a different career start than maybe going right from residency into into this career so um, the nice thing about the AACS is it is unique and that other people have similar experiences where they came from a career that they already had established or they came right out of residency but it really doesn't matter there's a pathway for everybody and as you've seen at this meeting, I mean, the AACS really encourages communication and kind of collaboration with all different backgrounds. Um, so the nice thing about it is that it is multi-specialty. So all the different specialties that are represented, as Dr. Baji talked about, all kind of come together with this common goal of being, you know, the best cosmetic surgeons that we can be. And that's been really great. So um, we're all trying to advance this one field. And for me, I've had a unique benefit of training with somebody that's outside of my core. Um, so I am not with an oral maxillofacial surgeon. I'm actually with an oculoplastic surgeon. So it's been really interesting to see a different perspective on certain things. You know, our basics of operations are a little bit different, but in the end, surgical principles are surgical principles. So um, you kind of are all united that way. But I would really encourage you to look at other opportunities. Don't just pigeonhole yourself into applying or ranking the people that are within your core field, because there's definitely a benefit to moving outside of that. You're a little out of your comfort zone. I never thought I would see so many eyes without corneal shields on them while we're operating, but um, it's it's been fun and I've learned quite a bit. So I would encourage you not to pigeonhole yourself. Um, the community of the AACS is extremely unique. Um, I think we, again, all have that common goal. Um, but everything that we do, even educational meetings, seem to come in to be a networking meeting. You're meeting new people, hearing more experiences. Um, so, you know, always doubling as meeting new people and having that way to branch out and, and increase your network that you have professionally is really, really unique. And everybody seems to learn from each other. It's not like, oh, this is my specialty, so you don't know how to do eyelids, and you know, I'm the best at this. It's, it's really a, a great community, so I've really appreciated that. Um, and then the big thing that we talk about is patient safety, and we should be safe surgeons, especially as we're trying to advance this field of cosmetic surgery. Um, and you know, if plastic surgery has a, an issue with us being safe surgeons, I think we have... Uh, a leg to stand on because we do put this as the, at the forefront. So um, having web clinics that talk about this, it's always a focus of anything that we do um, on our, our web meetings, Zoom meetings. Um, the digital library is really um, expansive, so and they're expanding it as we, as we speak. So it's a great resource for, I mean, I remember when I was in residency or in my first few years of my career, I was on the digital library all the time, hoping to get, you know, what, I, what can I get for free or what can I pay $50 for? You know, I was looking at every lecture I could watch um, and trying to soak it all in. Um, the review course is definitely something that they present as a way to get ready for boards and really make sure that you're ready to take your board and be a board certified surgeon in cosmetic surgery. And then I already talked about the networking events. Um, and then it is really nice as a fellow that you have the standardized curriculum. So as you, you know, in your residencies, you see that maybe residents at other locations don't have quite the same curriculum that you have, or everybody's just slightly different. Uh, and that's still true as you're, doing, you're training with different surgeons, but the core curriculum is really nice. Every month we have a meeting where somebody lectures one of the fellows, so you get to hear from everybody's perspective, but we're all getting the same information and kind of preparing together for the boards. We even have a a Google Drive that allows us to share information and have resources that everybody has access to. So it's almost like we're all in the same class spread across the country. Um, the standardized case requirements is nice. So you do know that, you know, if you're in an AACS program, you're gonna get these minimums that you need, especially for board certification. So I just listed them up there, but they're on the website. A little different for facial versus general. Um, and then, my favorite part about it is learning about the business. So it is about surgery, it's about being a safe surgeon and networking, but the business aspect of it is not something that we ever, I don't feel like I ever learned. And when you think about a cosmetic business, it's totally different from even your core business or taking insurance, things like that. It is a beast. And as a new practice owner, um, I built my own building and my husband and I own a practice together and he's getting started with it, I mean, I felt like I had no idea what I was doing. So I have every chance I get to talk to somebody and say, what are you doing? What did you do wrong? What can I avoid? It has been pretty amazing. And it's part of the curriculum of your fellowship too, 
is you spend time learning the business, learning how to be successful um, in actually either owning your own practice or joining somewhere. I mean, you know, whatever information you want, there are people in this academy that can help you get there. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brittany. I really appreciate some of the things that you said I want to reiterate, which is, um, you know, making sure that you reach out to people as you see her contact information is up there. If you feel shy to talk to people here, which please don't, they don't bite, but reach out on Instagram via email or whatever, however, to, um, uh, to get some more information about our organization and how to match into your fellowship and start your career. So I am the next presenter. So my name is Ruth Arumala again. I started off my career as an OBGYN and I never practiced general OBGYN. I finished and went straight to a minimally invasive GYN surgery um, fellowship and became a robotic surgeon. I actually taught myself robotic surgery because where I trained was in the middle of Oklahoma and um, it, we didn't have a robot, let me just say that. So I taught myself how to do robotic surgery and kept pushing myself, which sort of allowed me to have this idea that you can teach yourself surgery while getting guidance, right? I had a lot of mentors. And um, I was going through my, I, I owned a practice and I was a solo practitioner and I, um, I burnt out really fast, right? And I had always wanted to do cosmetic surgery. And my patients were asking me, well, you take out that fiber, why don't you take a little fat here? Why don't you do a little nip tuck here? My breasts are to my thighs, pick them up, girl. And I just didn't know how to do it. I told them, I, I just don't know. And one day, somebody, one of the reps introduced me to Dr. Ayin. And they said, oh, there's a gynecologist doing this. She's in Texas. She's African, just like you. And I found her on Instagram and I stalked her. I called her and I called her. I was like, you're in clinic, fine. You're in surgery, fine. You're delivering a baby, fine. You're doing, I didn't care. And one day she called me back and spent three hours on the phone with me. And that's how I started my journey. And then she was in Dallas a month later and she was like, come to my hotel room. And we talked and we did a podcast and we talked and we talked and here I am. So I wanna encourage you, if you feel shy to reach out to people, call and call again, and again, and again, because somebody at some point, somebody will um, reach out to you. So what I wanna talk about today is, what are the five unique things you can do right now to get you ready for a fellowship? I know, because I am one month into this as graduating, so let's go. So focus on your primary specialty. You got to crawl before you walk. You have to walk before you run. You have to finish and get board certified in your primary specialty. So as much as you love cosmetic surgery, one of the worst part about what my journey was, I matched in 2020 and I couldn't close my practice fast enough, but I had to do, I had to close everything and then move on because I needed to make sure that when I returned to the same um, community, I had my integrity intact. The next thing is make sure you don't shy away from the free resources. Brittany said that really, really well. There's so many free resources. And Dr. Maria Diaz is sitting on the second row and her, her and I realized that there's no specific Q bank for cosmetic surgery. We had not taken our boards. So we didn't know what's on the boards, but we reached out to a um, company called Stat Pearls, and they have a lot of question, they have a question bank. And we asked them, hey, you have this question bank, you have a plastic surgery, you have OMFS, you have all these other things, why don't we go through all your um, questions and pick out the cosmetic ones? So now we have a cosmetic Q bank, edited by Dr. Diaz and Dr. Rumala. And so you can do this, right? Get all the resources. Find the cadaver course. I went to the facial one last year and it was amazing. I had never done a brow lift before. I did not understand why eyes were looking at me. I'm used to a different kind of wink. 
And um, I was, it was great because that was before I actually stepped into the OR and did a brow lift. I already knew what to expect. I had talked to experts. So please take advantage of that. It's a low risk, calmer situation where you can learn, okay? Maximize your financial health. As you know, a lot of our fellowships don't have the funding yet. Hopefully that's coming. That's the next tier for us. But in the meantime, um, I am allergic to being broke. So I had to figure out how to make sure that my finances were stable. So talk to a financial planner. Make sure that you understand where like locums are in your area. Talk to some of us who use locums, right? And we're able to support ourselves because it can get quite expensive. I mean, I don't understand why Bellevue is so expensive. Someone needs to explain that to me. But consider all of that. Number four is um, we are not surgeons. We're artists and surgeons. So trying to develop an artistic eye is something that I think is extremely valuable. For me, it was learning how to do makeup because you actually, where you apply makeup is actually anatomically sound. So understanding that, understanding photography, like what are the different kinds of cameras, what, like things like that, what, is, what does an artist look at when they're looking at angles so that you can start to form a lifelong thought about you know, adding art, artistry to your performance as a surgeon. Dr. Peter Smith, I think that's how you say his name, has a um, sculpting for surgeons course. And how I found out about it is I walked up to Dr. Sobel and I thought I had this novel idea that no one had ever thought about. And I was like, we should do, we should get somebody to teach us sculpting next for this meeting. He asked me last year, like, you know, he was like, oh, that's been done a long time ago. I don't know what's wrong with you. Here's the, his number. Like, I was like, oh my God, there's actually somebody that does this. So I think he was here this year, right? I didn't run into him, but he, if you go online and you look at the work that he has done, oh my God, gives you a different eye. Dr. Mangaba is, and Dr. Um, um, Lombardo are his like biggest proponents because it gives you a different look as a surgeon because you're not just, anybody can just liposuction, just take out the fat and you look a smaller version of yourself. But there are people who can really sculpt a body. And I want to be one of those. The last is something that you might get pushed back from, you might not get pushed back from, because every time you expose yourself on a social media site, you're also exposing yourself to scrutiny. So you have to be aware of that, good, bad. And you could be like the celebrities that think bad press is good press, 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 press. So it depends on how you see it. I came in because I built my practice, my first practice, I actually built my social media presence that way. But that allowed me to continue to grow during this time. I have a co-fellow all the way in the back, um, Dr. Hayes, who started his personal brand page during our fellowship. I don't know if he had a separate one, but he started it. And it was very beautiful to watch it watch him do it because it's, it takes a lot of persistence to like get you and your wife and your co-fellows to like your stuff. That's all the only people that saw it. And you are persistent with it, but you will grow, right? And I always think with personal branding, this is my thought, that you can educate, inspire, and entertain, but you have to choose how you're gonna do it and which all of them have to be present but you have to choose in what capacity or per, uh, percentage. So for me, my pages are mainly educational. It's about 70% educational. The inspirational part is the insight to my life because unfortunately or fortunately for most of us, most people will never have the same socioeconomic status as you. So if they see your things, they think that your things are way above, but it might be inspirational to somebody. Your journey could be inspirational to somebody, your struggles, your failures. I expose all of it, right? I, I share my, my failures. I share my health journeys with patients so they know that I am not an immortalized person. I'm also human. I also had fibroids. I also do this and that and the other. So that might humanize you a little bit. And lastly, in terms of entertainment, please don't be stiff. 
practice in front of the mirror and talk to yourself. You're always talking to yourself. Right now, I'm talking to myself. You're always talking to yourself. That way you are authentic, okay? So that is it. That is my information. And I would love to um, go on to the next speaker. Thank you so much. So our next speaker, we're going from current and recent fellows to a fellowship director. Um, I know they told us that, you know, we should not say this person needs no introduction, but this person needs no introduction because he has basically trained half of us here. Um, Dr. Hayavi. Dr. Hayavi is in a, he's a practicing cosmetic surgeon and fellowship director who is in Rancho, I cannot say the second word. You're gonna have to say it for me. Yes. And so he is, he's been training fellows since 2001, and he's going to come up and he's going to talk to you guys about what fellowship direct program directors look for in their applicants. That's something I wish I knew when I was applying. Good to see everybody. Those were excellent talks. I loved it. Dr. Araman, Dr. Aitzen, excellent advice to people interested in cosmetic surgery. And I'm going to talk about a little bit about the fellowships and what directors overall look for and uh, give you some advice in that direction. So really, what, what is our objective as fellowship directors in teaching other people, what do we want to do? We have a passion for this field, you know? We love what we do, really. I say it every day, I feel so blessed to be doing this because I love it, I enjoy it. And we want to convey that information to you guys. We want you to learn the principles, practice, and the art of cosmetic surgery, because it is an art. It's not just science and surgery. We're treating people, we're dealing with their emotions, and we're combining all of these skills, all the principles we learned in surgery, in residency, people relations, interpersonal relations, and artistic ability into an end result to make our patients really feel better about themselves. And so um, in, in the process, what we want to accomplish really is to get you guys well-trained, get you guys board certified, and get you guys to join our community so you can be the leaders of the future. We really want to increase the number of competent cosmetic surgeons in the community. And we want you guys to be the top, the cream of the crop. We want you to produce excellent results and really be the leaders in your own micro environment and in the country. That's really the goal uh, for us in doing a fellowship. So there is a process with uh, all of that, and I'm gonna briefly go over the process. I know this slide has been shown before, and you guys may be familiar with it. Uh, what you wanna do is you wanna prepare for the application, and you can do that months ahead. You know, Look at the eligibility, look at the different pathways, make sure that you have your people that are writing the recommendation letters uh, geared up and ready to produce those letters for you. <laughs> Because by the February of the year before you want to start the fellowship, you have to have all of that submitted into the academy. Okay? Then after you submit your application, the applications go to the program directors, all the ones that you want to apply to. You can apply to as many programs as you want. And that's the time where you get the opportunity to come and visit the programs. You know, be proactive about it. Don't just wait for the program directors to call you. If you're interested in a program, even before this process starts, you can go ahead and send an email, call the program director, call their office, say, hey, I'm interested in this. Is there any way that I can come and visit you? We appreciate that. We, we like people that are go-getters. We like people that are interested in this and are here to learn it. So reach out, it's okay to reach out. Don't be intimidated. You know, all of us are invested in your success. You know, I look at all of my fellows, and I'm sure Susan Obaje does the same thing, and all the program directors. We look at you guys as our children. You are a representative of our, you know, practice. So we want you to be successful. And then, you know, we all rank, right? You guys for the 
July positions. I have two positions. It's a July and January. In July position, it's a ranking position. There is a ranking list. So we submit uh, our ranking list and you guys submit your ranking list by June. And by June 15, we already know who's going to be coming to the program. So that's, that's the process overall. It's really not very intimidating. You know, the visits to the programs are just an acquaintance. We, I like people to spend a couple of days with me. It's nice. We get to know you. You get to see us. You kind of get introduced to the practice, to the surgery staff, all of the staff in the clinic, and we just want to see how everything flows. So be yourself. My biggest advice is be yourself. When you come in, just feel comfortable and, and be yourself. So what do we really look for? You know, we, doing a fellowship is a commitment. We understand that you are already through a lot of training, years of schooling, right, an internship, a residency, and uh, this is an extra year of training. So we know that, you know, this is a sacrifice on your part. And I would say probably all, if, if not most of the program directors did a fellowship themselves. Um, so this is an elite group. Uh, and we expect you guys to have these characteristics. We want you to have the drive and the enthusiasm, right? Yeah, I know it's an extra year of training, but if you really want to have these skills, this is the best way to do it. I tell all of my fellows before they start, this is gonna be the best year in your training. It's gonna be the cream of the crop because it was for me, you know, and uh, it was for many of the program directors, right? My fellowship year was really the best year in my day. It solidified everything that I learned before for so many years, and it's gonna be the same for you. We want the fellows to have that drive and enthusiasm. We want them to have good communication skills. We want them to have good people skills because really what we're doing, we're treating people. And a lot of medicine is, oh, I have a bump here or I have pain here and I need to come in and treat. But well, that's not the way it is in cosmetic surgery. You know, some patients may come into your office and they tell you, you know, what do you recommend? And really I tell them what bothers you? Because cosmetic surgery is elective. You don't need nothing that I do, right? There is no necessity for it per se. But there is a necessity that is subliminal. And patients feel uncomfortable by, about a certain part of their body or face, and they come to you to you know, help them with it. So communication skill is very important. People skills are very important. And you're going to work in a team. It may be a team of you know, a handful of people, and it may be a large team of 50 people. You know, I started my practice with only six employees. We have 52 now. And so it's a big team. Uh, it's a big family. <laughs> so, you know, you have to be a team player. You have to be able to work with other people. You have to be able to communicate well. And we want you to take initiative. It's, it's important to take initiative. You know, why? Because when you work in, in a group, in a team, right, everybody has their own task, but Sometimes you have to do something outside of your task. So don't be shy to lend a hand to somebody else in the operating room that needs something done. You know, be a team player. Uh, be well prepared for your cases. You know, make sure that you, you read, you are well aware of the anatomy and all of that. And of course, you know, personal character, we, we, we want people to have honesty, integrity, humility, that goes without saying we want you guys to be reliable and dedicated and, of course, good surgical skills. Good basic surgical skills will help you, to, you know, hone those skills in the fellowship and really become excellent in what you do. Um, so how do we assess all of this, right? It's a, it's a complex process. I, I think, you know, when I get an applicant, I, I have gotten applicants early, late, you know, after the match, before the match, and I want to say, you know, the best applicants are the ones that submit stuff on time and have everything done neatly and well organized. And letters of recommendation are extremely important. You know, we want, that's how we get a window into what other people think about you, you know, and that have had exposure to you over the years. So letters of recommendation are very important. You know, I, I try and speak to the program director or one or two of the letters if I, if I can. And, um, you know, we can assess when you visit, we can assess the level of interest. So uh, my best advice to you is if you're going through all of this process, really 
Don't be timid. We're all very inviting. We're all very warm. We want you to succeed. So when you visit, be yourself. You don't have to you know, be anybody else. Just be yourself and, and um, interact with everybody. The interview process, of course, I think is the part where we really get to know you. Right, the recommendation letters are fine, you know, papers you wrote and all the activities and the CV, they all give us a picture, but when you come in, uh, I think that's where we really decide if you are a good match, because as I said, we're all a big family, right? We all have our own individual practices, and that's, that's a unit of a family, and we want you to fit into our family. We want you to be a good match, and the same for you. You want to feel comfortable at the program. So... What are the responsibilities of a fellow? Um, I think, you know, we, me particularly, I want the fellow to be involved in every aspect. You guys covered very well, both of you, as to all the different unique things that you get to be exposed to when you do a fellowship like this, as opposed to a fellowship in a hospital. You know, with, with a fellowship that is in a private setting, standalone surgery center, or, or a center that's associated with a hospital, you get to, thank you, you get to um, really not only learn surgery, you get to learn business, you get to learn how to accredit the surgery center, how to treat anesthesia emergencies, surgical emergencies, and all of those things come into play in success of your practice later. So fellows assist us in every step of the way, pre-op, intra-op, post-op care, and the fellowship directors do this because they have a passion for teaching. They are invested in your success. And in turn, they want individuals that are dedicated to their practice, patient, and specialty. And frankly, you know, every person that I hire in my office, I want the same dedication. I give them a similar lecture at a different level, but they, we're all towards the same goal. So if you have any questions, don't hesitate to call me. My email is dr. Hayavi, H-A-I-A-V-Y at Gmail. I'm sorry I didn't include it, but you can reach out and I'll be happy to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hayavi. That was excellent. Um, I think that one of the things that he said, which is so important, is making sure that you incorporate yourself into the group of like, wherever you are. So in residency, the difference is that you rotate from one place to another place. You're there for five weeks, six weeks. As soon as you know what you're doing, they're like, oh, you got to move. But here you're there and you marinate yourself in the same team. So making sure that you take ownership of the patients, ownership of the practice, very, very important as a fellow, which is very different from when you're a resident. All right. So we have a very interesting combo. And so they're going to be taking us through the life of a cosmetic surgery training fellow. And I want to introduce and welcome to the stage Dr. Kirk and Dr. Conguista. Did I, did I get it? No? No, 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 it's very far, I'm sure. I want you guys to introduce yourselves because there are two of you, and I don't want to, I want you guys to tell us a little bit more about yourself as you talk to us about how to your lives are as cosmetic surgery fellows, current cosmetic surgery fellows. How is this? So forward, backwards. Oh, okay, great. Good morning. Um, so we were asked to uh, speak mm -hmm. about the day in life of a cosmetic surgery training fellow. We just did a brief overview of our program. And although the themes of the fellowship are and universal. There are a lot of differences between programs. So we do recommend that you reach out to other fellows and program directors to talk about the, their program um, specifically. Um, we are both training with Dr. Kozalina at uh, Tulsa Surgical Arts. Uh, typically he takes one fellow, but we convinced him to do a couples match. So <laughs> we're together, uh, both from the East Coast. I did my training, dental training at UConn and then uh, medical school in OMS at uh, Mayo Clinic. And then Dr. Pajusta uh, did his in New York uh, for his dental degree, and then uh, Thomas Jefferson University for medical and OMS. So Tulsa Surgical Arts, obviously in Tulsa, um, Dr. Kozalina is the program director. There are also three other surgeons that work at the surgery center. Dr. Whitlock is a plastic surgeon, Dr. Son and Dr. Ptolemeo are uh, previous fellows that come back intermittently and operate there. 
Um, it's an outpatient surgery center. We have two operating rooms. There's a private anesthesia group that comes and provides anesthesia for us in both operating rooms. There is a uh, med spa that operates independently of the practice. Um, there's an overnight suite for patients to stay. And we have our own in-house uh, lymphatic drainage specialist who is here if you'd like to talk to her. So um, our weekly schedule, typically what we do since there's one program director and two of us, um, we will basically alternate from week to week as who's primary assist with uh, Dr. Kozlina. Um, the other one will typically go and operate with either the plastic surgeon or uh, one of the previous fellows that comes back. So it's good to get a, a different aspect um, from different surgeons. If there's face cases, uh, we'll both scrub uh, just so we can get the exposure because the majority of what he does is body. Um, the uh, weekly schedule, we operate Monday through Thursday, um, typically two to three cases a day. So on average, eight to 12 cases under general anesthesia a week. And that's just with Dr. Kozlina. So if we're next door with a different surgeon, we finish up, we come and scrub with him. So it's actually more than that. Um, at the end of the day, there are some local procedures that we'll do, some revisions, scar revisions. Um, but most of what we do is under general anesthesia. It's very rare that we do anything um, under sedation. Uh, we do see rounds of patients with consults, pre-ops, and uh, post-ops. And then as far as call, we just switch off every week um, or every other week, uh, or every two weeks, um, just covering call at night. Thank you. Thanks for having us, everyone. Um, so this is our more nitty-gritty daily schedule. Uh, two things that I forgot to put on the slide were at the tail end. So at usually around 6.30, 6.45, myself and Dr. Kirk will see the patient who stayed overnight in our overnight suite. Usually it's patients who've had a abdominoplasty, but other patients also stay there, some who are from out of town or who've had multiple uh, procedures simultaneously. So 6.30, 6.45, we'll come into the office, we'll see them, make sure everything went okay overnight. Um, they took in good PO, had good urine output, drain output was appropriate, and then we'll report that to the nurses and Dr. C. And then the office usually um, becomes busy around 7.15, so that's when our first patient gets there, and then pre-ops and consults as well. So we mark the patient first with Dr. Kozalina in the room, obviously, and um, we can ask him questions, um, ask him why we're putting the incision in certain places, and after patient is marked, then we kind of since there's two of us, we split ways. So one, we'll see mostly pre-ops who come in usually two weeks before surgery, and the other will see um, new patient consults. Um, and then after that, we try to catch up with Dr. C and see how as many post-ops as we can, because I feel like that's pretty um, important as a educational, uh, as a learning fellow. Um, it's important to see your post-ops. Then by around eight o'clock, the patient is by that time back in the operating room. And so we change and uh, go start the procedure um, with Dr. C. And depending on what procedure we're doing, usually the cases last anywhere from like one to four hours. And then after that, we rinse and repeat. So next round of consults, pre-ops, usually there's at least one other procedure going on under general. So we'll mark that patient as well and then um, repeat that again a third time in the afternoon. Sometimes if there's two cases or if we finish early um, and they are, um, they know this ahead of time, we'll have an office procedure and usually that's in the afternoon because it doesn't require as much time. And then we uh, finish around four, well the office finishes around four and then Dr. Kirk and I will finish notes, call patients around on the, the new suite patient who stayed overnight from the, today, the day's procedure and um, go home after that. So I, I think everybody who spoke today already touched on this a little bit, but our main priority um, is learning how to do surgery and how to treat patients safely. Um, at Dr. Kozalina's fellowship, um, we also see our, uh, see all the consults, or as many as we can, and the pre-ops as well. And then we, um, like I said before, follow him um, around for the post-op visits as well. We help the nurses or the concierges take out sutures, staples, redress the wounds, um, all that. So it's pretty, pretty well-rounded program. 
and be a sponge. You know, the, you're there to learn. There's all different specialties that can be can apply for these fellowships. Um, so it's a lot to learn in such a short amount of time because I, I feel like most residencies don't really do cosmetic surgery. So it's a big learning curve. So you just try to absorb as much as you can. And um, oh, and the AACS is, uh, has a monthly core curriculum review and um, they also have uh, web clinics that uh, fellows get uh, heavily discounted to. I think they're free actually. Uh, for, so web clinics as well. So every month there's two, at least two um, Zoom sessions or webinars that all the fellows and um, other fellowship directors and cosmetic surgeons can uh, go, go and uh, watch and learn from and ask questions as well. The perks of working with Dr. Kozalina, um, there, uh, I feel like the list is endless. Um, first of all, he's well-established, um, and a lot of our fellowship directors here are well-established too. You know, their private practices are, at this point, well-oiled machines, so um, it's good to see the business side. You get to work with an excellent staff. Um, you get to attend some parties that, you know, they throw, and it's, it's been great, so it's, it's, it's really awesome. You know, it's not all um, business all the time. You know, you do get to unwind a little bit and relax, and, um, yeah, uh, you know, being connected through uh, the AACS, <clears throat> networking, um, you get to meet people from all across the country. You know, the one thing about, one of the many things about this society is that there are fellowship programs literally all over the 50 states, so, um, and everybody seems to know Dr. Kozalina too, so he can put you in touch with people who, um, you know, in, in your area that you want to practice in. Um, and then there's work-life balance too, you know, it's, um, it's a grueling fellowship, you're there to learn a lot, but there's also time to spend with the family. Um, Dr. Kirk uh, lives with his wife and kids in a uh, suburb of, or city next to Tulsa, and my wife and uh, daughter, we live in another state, so we're doing the long distance, but we do have time to see each other um, and spend time with the family too, so it's, it's not all, uh, it's not all, um, business. So it's very, very good. Do you want to comment on that? Sure. So, yeah, it, I, I think uh, for those of you who have families, it makes things much more challenging. Um, my wife is uh, sacrificed a good amount just to follow me around. From She wanted to stay in Connecticut for our entire lives. So for her to go to Minnesota and then to come uh, to Tulsa, it's, it's she's definitely supported me. But uh, it's challenging. So I usually wake up around 5.30 and round on my patients, make sure their urine output's good, change their diapers. <laughs> <clears throat> and hopefully I can sneak out of the house before they wake up just because it's mayhem. Um, and then by the time my day ends, it just I get home and have to, you know, find some time to read and spend time with them. So it, it, it is challenging, but it's definitely doable. And I think most of the program directors are, are aware of that. And um, Dr. Kozlana definitely is accommodating and you know, knows that family time is, is definitely important. So, um, yeah. And I didn't even have to use these, so thank you guys for your help. So, you know, I hope that you guys, um, whoever are the residents here, you are able to pick apart some of the questions that you can ask when you go on your fellowship. That, that was the whole point of that, is that, you know, when you go on your fellowship, you can ask things like, what is a typical day like? Um, what kind of setup? How am I involved? How would you like me involved? Um, you can ask the other, the current fellows those questions too, so that you get a full flavor because everybody's is slightly different, right? We have a standardization of what needs to be done, how it's done is different. So you get to know if that's gonna fit into your family into your lifestyle and into what you want to get at the end of the day. In addition to that, for instance, if your fellowship doesn't offer opportunities with the med spa, mine didn't, right? Um, didn't uh, offer opportunities with injectables, skincare. Dr. Obaji knows how much I love skincare. Um, and so I expressed that to my program director, Dr. Um, Alex Sobel, and so he got me an opportunity. So sometimes it doesn't exist. And so you can ask, and maybe nobody has asked before, or maybe there was an opportunity that was created, but nobody else wanted it. 
So there might be something that's an opportunity if you ask for it, okay? So don't feel, feel you know, that you can't ask those questions. So next I'm gonna ask Dr. Banky to come up to the stage and he's gonna talk to you about board certification. Why is this important? Why, why do we need to tell the world that we have a standardized curriculum that we've been able to master? So thank you, Dr. Banky. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for attending this. Uh, Dr. Baji, thanks for inviting me. Uh, so uh, just to give you a quick background, uh, basically an OMS trained board certified in oral maxillofacial surgery. I attended UConn and then I was in private practice for about uh, five, six years, at which point I decided to sort of expand my horizon and uh, attend one of the fellowships. I did Dr. Nuveen's fellowship in Oklahoma City, which is a general full body uh, training uh, fellowship. And upon gradu uh, graduation, I took my boards. And then just so that you know, it's just a very small community of uh, people. You get really get to know everyone. Everyone's great deal of camaraderie. Everyone's uh, ready to help you out with your questions. There's just really not, you know, competitive cutthroat type of environment whereby you may see it in other societies. People compete over research, research grants, and try to get a name for themselves. Here, everyone's out there to help you out. So uh, whoever is considering, by the way, uh, you said the residents, who's uh, like uh, general surgery, who is general surgeon? Yeah, okay, OBGYN? Okay, uh, oral maxillofacial, ENT? And uh, so that's great, uh, and dermatology. Okay, ophthalmology. All right, so yeah, so it seems like there's a huge trend towards uh, general surgery and OBGYN. Uh, historically, there's been a good number of people in oral maxillofacial surgery. If you see Dr. Hayavi and Dr. Kozalina, Dr. Nuveen, and dermatology, but it seems like the trend, the word's getting out, and that's really the majority of people because it's just you guys represent a bigger number of people, you know, re relatively speaking. Um, so I've uh, Basically, after finishing, I immediately got very much involved in the uh, academy and on the board. You know, I remember Dr. Will asked me to be the chair of the fellowship committee and the membership committee. And, you know, Margaret's seen me <laughs> since I graduated. And then Dr. Obaji, one time I call, called me, I was in Chicago, and she said, do you want to be a board of trustees? And I almost never said no, and, and got me to a point where, like, I had to fold this over because... I'm short and it's just embarrassing to have like all this stuff, but like just to represent, just to show you that it's just very easy to get to know people and get involved and I highly recommend that if you are considering doing the fellowship, do it and be all in it and, and make sure that, you know, you contribute and, and pay back uh, after graduation and, uh, you know, just make sure you're very active in, in this community because everyone tries to do their best to promote cosmetic surgery. Now, with that said, you know, I'm, I happen to be the, the president of the American Board of Cosmetic Surgery, and, you know, it's, it's a, is anyone board certified? You guys are still in residency, correct? Nobody, well, yeah, but you finished, yeah, exactly. Of course you are board certified. Yeah, so, no, I'm just talking about your core uh, specialty. You're still finishing, right? No, nobody, okay. So, it, it's a board exam, just like anything else. The idea is to assure that you're safe and you are a, pra a practicing surgeon that knows the material. And, and you know, the, it's an exercise. It doesn't per se examine you in all aspects of being a good physician. It doesn't test you necessarily on your ethics, it doesn't test you necessarily on your surgical skills. No one watches you perform it, but overall it gives you an idea about what comprehensive uh, study of the topic is and then be able to sort of defend your decision making, your treatment planning in an oral uh, exam environment. Uh, in order, so th there's been a change recently. So when you do your fellowship, that, that one year, uh, one of the requirements has become, we, we're just trying to promote that people become board certified. And historically, when we left it to people to do that voluntarily, and we're not trying to twist anyone's arm, but the idea being is that people sometimes postpone it because we all know how physicians are. They just want to study, study more, study more. And when you're out there uh, making a living and you're really busy, sometimes there's no force in your family and you may just postpone it, postpone it and get to a point where maybe you exceed the, the time frame where, by which you uh, can actually sign and challenge uh, the board examination process. So 
Now, before you graduate, we require that you do the written component, which is probably the best time to do it. As everyone mentioned, there is uh, the uh, monthly core curriculum, which is basically we ask, Margaret will ask uh, each one of you guys to do a very comprehensive uh, PowerPoint presentation on that particular topic. And if you really kind of study for that and study other people's PowerPoints, which are available to you, uh, along with obviously you're actively pursuing and studying cosmetic surgery, uh, by the time you are ready to graduate towards the end of your one year, you should be very well qualified to take the exam and just get it out of the way. And then a couple months later, you can go ahead and challenge the oral component of it. Uh, let's see, fellowship train, AC approved cosmetic surgery fellowship training program. So I think we kind of, uh, now, the only one thing noted on the bottom is that, you know, when this organization formed initially, we did not have really organized fellowship programs and or they were very sparse and a lot of people grandfathered in by virtue of presenting the, their uh, uh, case logs and then challenging the board. But now the, the one pathway available in order to become board certified, either American Board of Cosmetic Surgery or American Board of uh, Facial Cosmetic Surgery is via the uh, finishing a organized fellowship program, uh, which we have many. And as I had a talk yesterday, you know, it shows that the numbers have gone since I graduated in the past 10 years or so, the numbers have gone from 12 or 13 to now almost upwards, uh, high 20s, almost maybe 30. So we're, we're expanding at rapid phase. Uh, let's see. So I, I think I meant, mentioned both of those, the topics clearly covers the subject matter. We, we discussed that and there is a review course that Dr. Mangabot uh, offers, obviously we trying to, so the academy is the educational arm and the board is certifying arm and we try to obviously keep those separate. We don't want people on the board to provide you know, review courses because that would be a conflict of interest. And Dr. Mangabot, because of that particular reason, has been conducting these review courses and not is, is not a board uh, examiner. Uh, and, and that's great that you are incorporating some cards or some study material, uh, question material, uh, which may we offer you a price and purchase that for you in order to, no, I'm just kidding, but for copyright purposes. But anyway, that's great. Uh, let's see, uh, the, these, okay, the, the, the board examination process, the written component, we have uh, the uh, NBO meet, the National Board of Osteopathic uh, Board Examiners, it actually assures that these are psychometrically sound. These are not a bunch of questions that somebody writes. Uh, so these are questions that are tested and uh, validated by virtue of statistics. And so, you know, the, the caliber of the board has really been raised to be equivalent to what's out there on any other board, and, and indeed people put a good bit of time and effort to assure that. Um, and obviously, it goes without saying, I mentioned that the, uh, the benefits of being board certified beyond being a safe physician or practitioner and knowing the material, obviously it's good for marketing and good, good for standing uh, within the community and just having that recognition. I think we covered all the stuff from memory. All right, uh, let's see. For the most part, all of this we went through. So if you have any questions, please feel free to, uh, I will mention that my uh, email is an AOL email, but it's mobanky at AOL.com. Don't make fun of me. Uh, but it's easy to remember it just, and I'll provide you with my cell phone, uh, Margaret can do that or I can give it to you directly if you have any questions about that process. But obviously you need to finish your residency, you need to apply for the fellowship. I highly recommend that you do so. And then um, I, if there's any question in any capacity, I, somehow as you saw my credentials, I'm, I'm involved on both ends. So I'd be happy and any one of us is happy and more than happy to provide you with any information you want. And I highly encourage you that you do that, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Banky. So one of the things that he um, talked about was getting involved as much as possible. This is a small organization, both the board and the academy. So if you find a niche that you're interested in, women in cosmetic surgery, you're interested in um, fellowships and increasing education, those kind of things, um, the, the consult, the journal, 
If you're interested in something, ask, volunteer, please, please, so we can continue to have robust, new minds, fresh ideas, and continue to grow our um, organization. So before I continue with the last part of this, well, second to last part of this, I want us all to acknowledge Margaret for all the hard work she has done. All the hard work she's done. Thank you. She will tell you when you don't have things done. She will tell you when it's coming up. She will remind you. She'll ask you why you're so slow at doing this in the most polite way ever. Um, so we're going to go into a rapid fire sort of min uh, mini um, presentations about how to start a business. Because, you know, some of us are finished and don't, we're like, well, we don't know what to do next. So uh, we're going to have... Dr. Aying, Dr. Kim, and Dr. Ham talk about different practice settings. So Dr. Aying, I remember the first time we ever met, she told me that, you know, you guys probably in every specialty have what we call throwaway journals. In OBGYN, it's called contemporary OBGYN. To me, those are more valuable than the very long-winded, verbose um, articles that we have in the bigger journals because they're practical, right? And she used to tell me that she, she started when she was an intern, cutting out different um, things about practice management because she knew she was going to be a solo business owner when she was like 22. And so she put them in folders. And I started doing that. And I learned so much about business by just little every day because um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with the idea of no some days where you just do a little bit every day towards your goal, right? Or it's also called atomic habits, right? Little things, even if it's 1% towards your goal. So that's what I've been doing because she told me this in what, 2019? So you can imagine doing that almost every month since 2019, how much I've learned about business, okay? So thank you, Dr. Aim. And so I want you to come up and give us your best advice in five minutes about solo practice. Good morning, everyone. I have five minutes, so let's shoot. I am based in Houston and also Miami. I have two practices that I own, and I have a business partner in a third. I have helped many doctors in Houston and all over to open private practice, so it's my jam. It's fair to say that. And this is a little bit about me. I do business consulting, but it's very selective, exclusive. I don't put it out there, so you'll never see it on social media because I don't have time. It's just a matter of, do I vibe with you? Do I want to do this for you? And I don't charge, but I've learned in social media, you have to monetize your expertise, and I've not done that. Maybe I should. <laughs> she will. So to start your business, there are really some power things you need to know. Location, accounting, funding, privileges at a hospital is really important, and I want to hime on this as cosmetic surgeon. You will find that trying to get privileges at hospital is very hard. Your plastic surgery counterparts would do a fantastic job to make sure you don't get one because the pie they feel like is too small and they don't want to share. So you will fight, and you may win, and you may fail, but you have to press on because it's very important. Those logistics is important for our organization to change the paradigm and get us in places that we need to be as an organization. So I challenge every one of you, wherever you are, try to get privileges at hospital. You don't need it to do your job, but it's important to keep the organization in the forefront of hospital and just kind of grow it together. And I fought a lot of battles in Houston. I will tell you in a different time. Staffing is really important in your practice. That's going to make or break you. Obviously, people management is one of the things that you hear about in company, and you will have people that come from all walks of life. Some are in a great background space, some are not. As an as employer, your job is to draw boundaries, but at the same time be a human, and it's really hard when you get to know your staff and you know some of the struggles they have or um, life circumstances, and then you have to make choices and adjustment, but then you still have to run a business. So you want to be nice, but you also want to execute because at the end of the day, you have to pay everybody. And if there's no money coming in, your staff that as much as you love and care about, we move on and leave you behind. So it's really important to always keep that as a balancing act and not get yourself overstretched. In my case, I, I 
create boundaries the minute I hire staff. They know me as very sweet and very nice, but very firm and very clear about what she wants. So the expectation is you do it right the first time. That's it. There's no second or third. So when you have that mindset, your idea is to always give your best the first time. Um, the internal office, that's really important. You know, it has on, are you going to do cash only? Are you going to get insurance? Are you going to do marketing? Cosmetic surgery is really a cash services, but if you're going to have a surgery center, you know, it's not a bad idea to consider your surgery center doing insurance, but you, the surgeon, is cash only because you make a lot of money on that end. You know, there's a lot of red, uh, things that have happened that your reimbursement is going down, but if you build as a surgery center, you really make a lot of money doing that, as opposed to just charging patients $6,000, $10,000 for the surgery fee. You can actually bill and get 20, 30, 40. But again, things are changing. I've been practicing since 2007, and I've seen the paradigm uh, change a lot. So that's something to keep in mind when you open a surgery center. And this right here is just a nice overview you should think about as a resident. Just give yourself a one-year plan. If you've not thought about it, this is just a nice overview to keep in mind. Do you want to get credentialing? How do you want to do a business proposal? Because when you go to banks, the fact that you're a physician, you will get funding because you're high earning income. So you will get the money. It's really easy. But you have to have good credit. <laughs> and good credit will take you really far so you can get lower interest. And if you don't have a business funding, you think about how you're going to start your practice. Maybe you work another job and you're saving so that when it's that time, you can start it right, right away. But this is just a nice portfolio. You want to think about your licensure for states. Some states take longer, like in Texas. It can take you six, eight, nine months, or 11 months in her case to get licensed. So if you're thinking, I want to move to California or Florida, wherever, start early because you just don't know the process. And then do your homework. That's the most important thing. You cannot succeed if you don't do your homework. Uh, Ruth just mentioned it. Anyone that called me, because I get a lot of calls in my practice about how did you do this, what's not, I always say preparation, preparation, because you're going to succeed when you prepare. And this is just some things to keep in mind. And the timeline checklist, I'm not going to go over that. It's just for you. This is available through Margaret if you want to have it. It's a really good resource. And this is it. That's all my information. You can find me. As far as social media is concerned, I've been in practice for 14 years. And full transparency is a seven-figure practice. When I got on social media maybe two years ago, which is how she found me, I was like, what is this? Oh, my God. You know? And I'm still trying to figure out what is this? Oh, my God. So... The younger generation uses as a platform to grow, but for some of us that have been established and have the clientele, it's sort of like a different vibe for me. I'm there, sometimes I'm like, I don't really want to be there. And then sometimes I am. I still don't know what I'm doing there. But the younger generation, it seemed like a cool thing to do. So you can find me there, and I'm always welcome to questions. You guys can see why I consider her my... Um, mentor, my primary mentor in cosmetic surgery, her and Dr. Sobel, obviously, but yes, Sobel is the surgical side, she's my business side, and it's great that I look like her. Um, so I actually, the next speaker I sort of ran into um, by trying to research websites to look at what I would want my website to look like. So when I saw her today, I went to pretend like I didn't know who she was, um, so she didn't know I stalked her. So I want Dr. Claudia Kim to come up. Um, she'll be talking to us about small group practices, and she'll talk to you about her practice and how her practice is set up, but I challenge you to go on the website. It is tres bien. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, I was actually asked by uh, the Academy to give a short little lecture on uh, the transition into a small practice uh, immediately after pretty much fellowship. A little bit about myself. I'm not to closure here. A little bit about myself. I'm a native New Yorker. I'm trained in general surgery. Um, I'm a graduate of the fellowship run by Dr. Victoria Karlinski in New York. And I actually graduated right in the middle of the pandemic. So that was a 
a very interesting experience. And upon completion of my fellowship, I was asked by Dr. Karlinski to, to come on board to the New York practice as a director and uh, in the academy faculty. And we had opening an additional practice in Florida and an additional fellowship there. So um, when she asked me to come on board as a faculty, it was pretty much a no brainer. I didn't want to move, I hated moving. So it was an easy transition for us. So this is the current faculty, including myself. I am the main surgeon in the New York office. Um, Dr. Karlinski and Dr. Liliev are predominantly in Florida and Dr. Schatz uh, goes back and forth between New York and Florida. Now, going into the pros of joining a small group practice here. Now, if you're anything like me, you've been broke for the past 15 years, and you're graduating with a ton of student debt. So you may not actually have the financial capability of starting a solo practice right off the bat, or the experience. And so this is really a great opportunity for your first job as a grown-up surgeon. Now, learning the business. Many of us have really zero clue or training in the business aspect of running an office. And we're not really given, you know, the education in terms of business, logistics, finances. So this is really the opportunity to learn the ins and outs of running a practice. Or perhaps you have zero interest in running your own office. Either or, it may also provide an opportunity to potentially buy into a practice with part ownership to, to share the responsibilities and obligations. Now, I cannot stress enough the importance of having mentors when you're first starting off. Um, and even when you've been established for several years, you're gonna run into complicated cases. And so it's really important to have these experienced associates to share their experience and their wisdom. And that's also a reason why these conferences are so important to establish these relationships with the wiser surgeons and to really pick their brain. And having a small group practice allows that support to be close by so you can have them pop in and be like, hey doc, can and I you know, ask you about so-and-so. So that was a really good resource. Um, and also having the coverage for emergencies for when you're on vacation and, and vice versa is always appreciated. Now, uh, an established small group practice already has a presence in the community and a steady patient flow with referrals. If the practice is also offering injectables and non-surgical modalities, these are a really good source of conversion into surgical cases. And I also can't stress the importance of having an experienced support staff like a practice manager and patient coordinator and the front desk to support you as a new surgeon. And working for an established practice means that they are playing a vital role in how you're getting patients in promoting yourself and directing these patients to you and the physicians. Now, this can also be a challenge in working for a small group practice and you really need to ask these questions right off the bat and how this is gonna be done. And so for the next the challenges of being in a small group practice. So again, how are you being promoted? And how are these brand new patients being directed to you? How are you being marketed in terms of, are you responsible for your own marketing? Is there a social media support for you to brand yourself? Now, are there specific promotions for you to introduce uh, you to the community? And how are your services offered to establish patients? Because sometimes the established practices are a little bit hesitant to try new physicians, especially because they don't know you at all. And so are they given um, an opportunity or incentives to, to give you a try? And also you need to have that conversation with your colleagues to, to, to share these patients because some colleagues may not want that. So you really need to have these conversations beforehand. And another challenge with being the junior surgeon on the team is the type of cases that you might be assigned um, or even the available OR case or the OR times or the staff that is available. So these are all really important to ask um, when you're considering joining a small practice. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have and kind of share my personal experience. This is our, our waiting room. Um, Dr. Karlinski has established this beautiful practice. So it's really nice to be part of the family and be adopted into the family. Thank you, Dr. Kim, and you can see by their logo and their practice why I was stalking their page. Um, so the next speaker, um, I met him last year mainly because uh, he shares the same taste of suits as my husband. So I was obviously like, where did you get your suit? Where did you get your suit? So Dr. Ham, you can come up. He's also going to talk to us about corporate setting um, as a cosmetic surgery as he is a part of Sanobello. Thanks. 
Good morning, everyone. Uh, appreciate your, uh, your presence here today. So today I'm going to briefly talk about uh, what it's like to be part of a corporate practice. You know, I can, I can tell you that I've been part of a small group practice. Now I'm actually transitioning this whole practice. I'm, so I've got to run the whole gamut here. So uh, how do you advance? Yeah, okay. Thanks. All right. So uh, a little bit about me. Uh, my background is in general surgery. I was uh, Navy trained and spent uh, quite a few years with the Navy uh, and all expense paid vacations overseas as well. Uh, Middle East and Afghanistan and so on and so forth. So um, I've had kind of a circuitous route, much like uh, Dr. Essen has. Uh, so I joined the Cosmic Surgery Fellowship a little late in my career, but still here. All right, so uh, I don't know if these are necessary disclosures, because I'm, I'm currently employed by Sonobello and I'm part of the medical leadership team, so I'm in charge of training other surgeons that join the practice. So pros. The most obvious pro of being a part of a corporate structure is that you have no financial capital that's needed up front to start the practice. You join the team, they provide all the marketing, they provide all the employees, all the training, all the you know, leads for patients, and essentially you just show up and work. It's simple. And you know, obviously you get paid, and you, know, you get benefits, you get medical dental, you get you know, vacation days. And, uh, and the, it, at least in Santa Bell, the patients are pre-screened. So the process is that you know, they get fill out a questionnaire, they get pre-screened, and people that meet that criteria come in and see the patient consultant. Once they've signed on the dotted line and paid their money, that's when you see them. So it means no headache up front, and you just make sure that they're uh, candidates for the, for the surgery, and then you just operate. You do it again, you just show up on work. Now the cons, it is an employed position, so you don't really have a say-so in how the practice is run, or how the structure or anything else is set up. And, and you also have to remember, this is a corporate business. And so they frown upon you turning down a lot of patients for whatever reason. So you, you kind of have to accept patients you may not necessarily do so in your own private practice. Again, it's a corporate structure and it's profit driven. And so, you know, a lot of the cosmetic and plastic surgeons in town in Vegas will turn down patients with BMI greater than 35 for Temetox and other things like that. I've done them over 42, 45. You know, after about their full liposuction and lipoabdominoplasty. And so, you know, and then the way I go up about that is that I tell the patients up front what to expect and that the results aren't gonna be optimal, but you can still get it done. And the other downside that I'm having a hard time with is that, you know, professionally, I'm not that fulfilled. You have a very lack of variety in what you do. And these corporate uh, structures, they have a very narrow lane in what they provide because they want to streamline everything. So for Sonobello, we do liposuction of everywhere that has fat, essentially. And then we do these kind of modified uh, lipodomplasties. And so that's my uh, big concern or my major complaint is that I'm bored. You know, you spend a full year training to do everything, face, body, breast, everything, and then you're kind of pigeonholed in this narrow lane. But I'm going to tell you, that for those of you who want to practice but want a nice work-life balance, it's actually not a bad way to go. You get paid well. You have essentially no responsibilities once you leave work. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's out, of my, out of sight, out of mind for, in that case. And um, for me, and I, it may apply to some of you here, Come going from straight from residency to fellowship, you have no capital. So you can you actually use this as a transition to going to do something else. And essentially, that's what I've done. I left fellowship. I was going to join a practice in Vegas. Didn't work out. So I ended up starting a practice or, or joining a practice in Missouri where my wife's family is from. Um, as Dr. Kim had mentioned, there's some trials and tribulations of joining a practice that's already established. For me, it was mostly just you know competition for getting patients and trying to do the cases that I wanted to do. And... Luckily, COVID hit, and I was able to get out of my contract. And so and that's what I've used the last couple of years to save some money and get myself established in Vegas and network, and then uh, also with the ultimate goal of starting my own practice, because apparently I don't play well with others. <laughs> <clears throat> so again, in conclusion, when you join a corporate practice, you begin earning money right away with no upfront cost to you. Uh, and again, it can be, if you're looking for just having financial stability and the work-life balance, it's a great way to go. And it is, it is, again, as I mentioned, kind of what I've been using it for is a, is a transition to private practice, whether it be a group or, 
or a solo practice. And also gives you time to network and, and build your reputation in whatever town you choose. And you know, when I trained with Dr. Mandel Brown some five, six years ago, he said, he told me the, the toughest part is figuring out where you want to practice. Once you've done that, then everything kind of falls into place, All right? Uh, okay, so again, what's your goal? My contact info. All right. Dr. Ham. All right, thank you guys so much. Can we give a round of applause to all the speakers? Thank you guys so much for sticking to time, sharing all your insight, and giving us expensive information today. Thank you. Absolutely. I want to reiterate, thank you all for being here, residents, fellows, and all the board of director members here. And thank you to my colleague here and co-moderator. It's been an absolute pleasure getting to work with her and actually getting to know her more on the women in cosmetic surgery side as well. And you really are inspirational. So if you don't know uh, Dr. Arumala's story, I do think it's worth talking to her for a while because she's the epitome of a hardworking, well-focused, well-motivated cosmetic surgeon. And I think you'd be an amazing role model for so many people. Now, I'd like to invite all our moderators up on stage, please, and our lecturers, our fellows, and then the residents. This is being taped, so if you're going to ask a question, we ask that you come up to the microphone. And for our panelists, we have microphones up here. So feel free to come up to the microphone, introduce yourself, ask any question at all. Nobody up here. Um, is mean or is going to bite anyone's head off. Uh, while we get situated, one thing I didn't tell you all is, so we heard about solo practice, we heard about group practices. I'm in academia, so I have been in an academic setting since day one. So we started, I started as a resident coming here. I did my fellowship at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center in cosmetic dermatologic surgery. And then I stayed on. We had a change of chairman, and the head of the chairman of plastic surgery also dropped off and uh, retired. So there was a transition going on in their department. So we saw an opportunity with our new chairman to come in unopposed and open one of the first academically based cosmetic surgery practices in the US. This was back in 2001. And I've been there ever since. I train residents, I've trained fellows. We have visiting doctors from all over. So as you see, we all love to teach. We all love to share knowledge. And we're very excited to see everyone here who's interested in pursuing this career in the future. With that in mind, does anyone have any questions at all? Because if you don't, I do. All right, well. Yes. No, no, please. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Great presentation for all of you. This is mostly targeted towards the young doctors coming um, through residency and, and going to, uh, through fellowship, and they'll be looking for jobs, and you'll give great advice how to do it, how to do business. What about, if I have a question about uh, me, I'm established in practice since 2009. Well, I'm boarded in cardiac surgery, but I do cosmetics since 2009. And if I'm looking for the fellow to hire, what should I offer to them in my contract? And how do I structure it to be attractive, attractive to them so that they take the job with me? So uh, what is, that, what's the, is it a uh, base salary with the incentives and then partnership, or how does it work? What should I offer to them, Dr. Hayavi? Go ahead. There's lots of different options. You know, you have to see what's the best fit for you. Um, I think that an option that works well is probably starting a salary and a hybrid percentage of production, you know, after the first few months. Um, I think that works well because, you know, if you do a salary with no incentive, it becomes kind of lack of motivation, right? And if you do straight percentage, right off the bat, and you're not referring, you know, some doctors are very territorial and they don't refer patients to their younger colleagues. I don't know why, because if you hire somebody, you want them to be busy and make money for you. But 
that's just the way maybe it's the type A personality in us. But you want to, um, you know, make sure that they're successful. So I think some kind of a hybrid between a salary and maybe a percentage of production is a good way to go. But there's lots of different models, lots of different models. Great. Any other questions? Yes, please. And introduce yourself. Hi, my name's Rachel. Um, I'm a OMS resident. I'm in my last year. And so this is kind of more towards the OMS folks here, but I guess just in general, um, how are you able to, or do you have interest in incorporating your, um, your, uh, your tradition, or I guess like your traditional practice, so like with an OMS dental alveolar with cosmetics, and is that something that you feel is possible? I mean, there's only so many days in a week, um, like, you know, if you're OB-GYN doing cosmetics or if you're, you know, general surgery and cosmetics, like, do people have a balance of both or do they just pick one kind of and go with that? That's a great question. You want to well, okay. I'm a dual degree oral max guy, original training, and there are a lot of them here. <laughs> and uh, I practice cosmetic surgery 100%, but I know of many people, and I can introduce you to people that practice both uh, very successfully uh, all over the country, here in San Diego, you know, in Washington, in New York. There's Lots of people that are successfully practicing both. I think the key to success, though, if you want to practice both, is somewhat of a separation because you do want to have your primary specialty people, especially in oral maxillofacial surgery, separate from your cosmetic surgery patients because it is a different population. It's a different vibe. It's a different feel. So... I think it's more successful that way. So all the people that I know that have been successful at it have kind of a, either two separate practices or two separate waiting rooms and staff that's specifically trained to, you know, do cosmetic versus staff that do the traditional oral max. Well, I, I guess I can answer that question because I had a practice for 10 years and I maintained the practice when I went into training. I had a staff of eight, so I was flying between Seattle and Houston maintaining my OBGYN practice 100%. Well, I did pause the obstetrics just because of mental logistic. I didn't need that anxiety. And then when I returned back to my practice to incorporate cosmetic surgery, it was sort of like this dance, a routine that I had not practiced. And I found that, you know, I love my women's health space and I don't want to give that up. It's something that I'll always do because it just gives me joy. And I love cosmetic surgery. So trying to blend, uh, blend all three when you're a hybrid, it is challenging. So I've tested so many different things. And currently what I've kind of resorted to, which may change next week, I don't know, is that I have a designated day that was like my cosmetic surgery consultation day. So that that air of that day is we're all in that frame of, okay, this is just consult, this is post-op, this is pre-op. So it was kind of like dedicated to that. And then I'll have like other days that's like OBGYN or women's health or hormones. So that way we just focus on that and not really getting confused. Sometimes cosmetic may come in there because I'm talking to her about hormones, talking about life. She's like, well, what about the labiaplasty? What about this? So then it became a cosmetic. So I'll find myself kind of shifting back and coming back. And then I have a designated OR day. So you can make it a very complicated week. And I've constantly fine-tuned it, undo it, and added more. And you just kind of find your vibe. You know, obviously you see what kind of jives with you, make, what makes you happy, and also what brings revenue to the practice. And, you know, so it's just there's not a right way or wrong way. And he's right. I mean, you can get, like, designated staff for just one area and another. Because I really run a boutique practice, and as busy as I am, I like my boutique feeling. So everyone that I hire has to know everything, and you are trained to do everything. So there's no, um, the way I run my business is everyone is replaceable. So there's no, there's no perspective like, I am so good at this, you know, she needs me. And that's something you will learn as an employer, that when you really train your staff, they will be committed to you, but sometimes they feel like you need them. So I never want anyone in my office to feel like I need you for this to run. So everybody knows everything. So it kind of works out for me, and that's my style. I'd like to add to that as well, and I'd like to ask actually our panelists, because how many of you were in practice starting before 2008? 
So thinking back at that, remember when the recession hit in 2008, what did we rely on? A lot of us went back to incorporating a lot of our primary specialty. And those that didn't quickly saw that they were challenged in their strictly cosmetic practice. So there is some benefit to having a foot kind of in each side, and it may not necessarily be you over time, maybe that you bring another surgeon or physician into your practice that really does just that primary field. So that if there is a shift in the economy, you can quickly pivot safely. Did you guys find anything like that during that 2008 hit? Oh my gosh, it was a lifesaver, you know, 2008 and 2020. So, you know, we had two times that it hit. And like, for example, let's talk 2020 because we all know what that is. When it happened, the one thing that kept my practice going was obstetrics. I had not totally given up obstetrics when I came back from my fellowship, just because, you know, the moms didn't want to let go. I didn't want to let go. It was a relationship that we were all like hanging on to. So it was hard to say goodbye. But then when 2020 happened, I was like, God, this is why you told me not to let go. That was the only thing I could do. Not GYN surgeries, not cosmetic surgery, but babies are gonna come. So it definitely kept my practice surviving during that time. So that's why I think for me, I just never wanna give it up because I love it and it, you just never know. Dr. Happy. You know, I, I stayed 100% cosmetic, but certainly when oral surgery trickles in, I'm happy to do it. Those skills that you acquire, with your primary specialty, whether it's OBGYN, oral surgery, general surgery, they're always handy. And, and I agree, you can pivot and you can use them to your advantage. I mean, you've done all this training, all this hard work, don't give it up. I think it's good to keep up those skills. Or you can operate on your fellows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other questions? Hello, I'm a, my name is Kita. I'm a fourth year journalist. And my question for you within the different, or I'm sorry, the different fellowships, can you give me an idea of maybe your top three most comfortable with? And then aspects that you felt like you had to places outside of your fellowship to get, um, like. So I can ask, um, I did um, out um, facial cosmetic surgery fellowship. Oh, so we had a huge, a lot of surgeons have 13 or 14. So we get a lot of different, um, experiences when we spend, I spent about 70% of my time with Sobel. So he cloned me. Um, I look exactly like him, but, um, so, but I would say that, you know, he does something specific for his patient population. So he does lipoabdominoplasties. Um, and so we do, like, I think I did six or seven in a three-day period once. Um, he does transaxillary breast augmentation, which is really helpful for me, given that most of my patients prior to fellowship were black women or Hispanic women. And so having, not having an incision on your chest was really helpful for that patient population. And a patient population that tends to have hypertrophic scars and keloid skin. And then I would also say that, I mean, come on, we're liposuctionists. I mean, you liposuction till your arm falls off. My massage, my masseuse told me that my brachioradialis needs some work. So um, I say for me, that was the bread and butter. Every day you can expect you're gonna do some part of that at least once a day. I mean, we did rhinoplasty, facelift, all of that. I had 930 cases that I logged, and I only logged cases I did 50% of. So I had a lot more cases than that. You know, I can tell you, being of a general surgery background and having practiced for almost nine years before I started my fellowship, I felt very comfortable in the body. So abdominoplasties, you know, breast dogs, you know, thigh lifts, all that stuff, I felt very comfortable because I knew the anatomy and I knew to handle that tissue. For me, what was challenging was the face because, you know, as a general surgeon, I didn't really go above the, the chin. I would do thyroids and parathyroids and, you know, things like that. But uh, unless it was trauma related, I didn't do anything in the face. So that's what I found the most challenging during my fellowship was doing rhinoplasties. And unfortunately, my mentor, Dr. Mandel Brown, does all of his rhinoplasties closed. So I didn't see anything. So I don't feel comfortable doing rhinoplasties. I don't incorporate it in my own practice. 
but facelifts, you know, blepharoplasties, I mean, you get to learn it pretty well. And so, you know, choose a fellowship director that does a wide variety of procedures so you can exposure. And, you know, with Dr. Mando Brown, he allowed him to travel to other surgeons that he had relationships with that did more of a certain procedure. So I would spend a week or two there so that I get the exposure. And I would say, like, coming from OBGYN, where the space is completely different and you have to do phase, the way I did in my fellowship to help me, because I didn't have a lot of time, it was either I was there or I was in my practice. So I did rely a lot on reading, on going online, seeing other surgeons that have put different procedures there, observing it, and really learning that. And then so when I'm doing that one case, I have watched like 20 different videos of it, so I maximize my experience at that moment. And being a surgeon, you already have that knack for things. So it's a lot of see, it, do it type of thing. So you will find a way to be creative to just kind of get what you need in wherever you go in your fellowship. Just going to add to that, I think the strength of our academy and all of our fellowships is the diversity. And the diversity and collegiality is so good. So, you know, if you're a general surgeon and you don't have to seek just a general surgeon to do your fellowship. You can do it with a face guy, and you'll see face, and you'll learn face. I've had fellows, I don't do her. They are interested in her, Dr. Dastu is here. He wanted to do her. We arranged a two-week rotation for him with Dr. Barusco. So he ended up going to Dr. Barusco and learned her. You know, so there is a lot of connections, a lot of ways that we can provide more training to you that you want that may not be necessarily in the fellowship itself. We all have lots of affiliates. You want to learn non-surgical rhino, you can go to Alexander Rifkin and spend time with him. You know, so there's lots of opportunity. You just have to voice what you want. I wanted to add one more thing since this is being recorded. I know there's not a lot of OBGYNs here, but I would say my most challenging part of my fellowship was not necessarily seeing other parts of the body. OBGYN, you operate in a pot. So the pelvis is a pot. You don't have to care about planes. And so for me, it was very difficult to learn planes. And I noticed that when my counterparts, there were other from other fellowships or some for other primary specialties, they understood planes. And I used to drop a scope and drop my instruments and then operate in a pot like this. And then now I have to change everything really superficially very difficult mindset change. And I think that if you are a um, OBGYN going into this or somebody that operates without planes, I think that you should give yourself some grace because that's the learning curve is because you're not used to understanding that they're tissue planes and that you should operate and stay in a tissue plane and not hack through tissue. Thank you. And I think we've come to the end of our time for our session here. Does anyone have anything that they want to make a point on? Actually, I just want to plug, put a plug in for uh, the next section, the session that's going to be here for the new surgeons committee. We've got some great speakers yeah. coming in talking about social media, how to build a practice and so on and so forth. And uh, so I'd invite all of you guys to join us here at 11 o'clock. And I'm going to put a plug for my session because it's the last one of the day. And I'm the last speaker of the last one of the day. So it's all on complications. And that's actually really important to come and see because this is all fun and games, but when you have the complication and how to manage it with grace, that's the most important part. Thank you all for being here. Please email us any thoughts, suggestions, ideas. Thank you all as well. This Thank is you amazing. guys so much.